Welcome to the Recruiter Abroad podcast. My name is Dulta Doherty, and in this podcast series, we will be bringing to life the amazing stories of recruiters who have emigrated abroad around the world. Today in the Recruiter Abroad show, I'm joined by Gareth McGlynn. Gareth is a former professional footballer with Derry City. He's worked for Robert Walters in Western Australia and for Hayes in New York, along with his wife, Kira, who herself was a top performer at S3 they have set up their own staffing firm, Niche SSP. In this interview, we discuss his journey, the challenges, the highs, the lows, and what it was like to transition from a professional sports career into a career in recruitment. I hope you enjoy. Good afternoon, Gareth. Hey, Dulda, how are you? Not too bad, not too bad. Uh, welcome to the first ever episode of Recruiter Abroad. Uh, thanks very much for uh, taking part in this. Good, man. Well, no, thanks for having me. Um, well, it's my first podcast as well, so this should go well. <laughs> I'll go easy on you. <laughs> okay. So I give everybody a quick intro into your background. Um, but what we're going to do today is just to elaborate a little bit on that. So just to begin with, tell us, how did you end up going from professional football to a career in recruitment at a relatively young age for a footballer and a late age for somebody going into a large recruitment agency? Uh, well, it's hard to say when it actually first began, but back um, back when I was studying, my parents always told me, listen, if you want to become a footballer, do one thing beforehand and get your degree. Um, so once I got my degree in 2006, it was like a free-for-all. I just had the joy of playing football for almost 12 years, um, played through my degree. And then when I was 29, uh, with the recession in Ireland, there wasn't as many big businesses or big businessmen putting as much money into football. So I decided to relocate to Perth, Australia. When I arrived in Perth, like every other Irish man, um, I was kind of deciding what to do when I got there. Um, tried my hand at a few, a few different things, went to the mines for four or five weeks. And then I met a few people just through networking and in, in through with the Irish the Irish expats in Perth, um, a lot of people were involved in recruitment. Um, got speaking to, to one person in particular. Um, they advised me to go and have an interview. And my wife, well, my girlfriend at the, t- the time, my, now my wife, was the same. We both interviewed for uh, a couple of recruitment companies and it all started from there. I, I ended up picking Robert Walters and started within two or three weeks. Excellent. And... Talk to talk to me about the difference between an average day as a as a footballer and what your life was like then to coming into a really busy Robert Walters office in Perth. Well, as uh, as people kept reminding me, once I stopped football, they they said I needed to get a real job. So it it literally was like that starting out. I remember I did the first time I had a quotations real job was I did the uh, the placement year in my fourth year at college went to Dublin and worked at, at East Point Business Park um, for a company called Filenet and pre- previous to that I'd been playing professional football for seven years while studying at the same time and it was a big transition um, but then in tw- when I was 29 I'd met, made the conscious decision I needed to get a career outside of football it wasn't going to last forever I only had four or five years left um, so going into recruitment, to, to say that it was a shock to the system would be an understatement. Um, working nine to five, and as we all know in recruitment, eight to eight to seven. <laughs> um, that that was probably the biggest shock in relation to the skills that I picked up being a footballer and uh, transferring them over to recruitment. Um, there wasn't a lot of. There wasn't a lot of uh, there was there was a lot of synergies basically. Um, so simple things like repetition. So when you're playing football, you're only training for maybe three four hours a day. 
um, the rest of the time you're 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 relaxing. Um, but repetition on the football field, practicing the sacrifices that you had to give up, um, the dedication to 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 the sport, to your position, um, the teamwork, the culture within the, the team was really really important. I went through maybe four or five very good managers during my football career. Uh, and I learned a lot from them about the culture and the teamwork that they kind of, the ethos that they, they put on the team. So I kind of took all those skills and, and brought them in the recruitment. But the biggest challenge that I faced was being told what to do at 29 years of age. Um, and, and, and Gareth, I know you quite well. I, I think you would face that challenge if you were 50 years old. <laughs> uh, it was strange it was the strangest thing in the world um, and funny when you think back about it I was uh, nobody really ever had to tell me how to play football um, and most footballers obviously they learn throughout their career but you, you either you're either talented and you get to a certain level or, or you generally don't everyone gets to their level um, and I think I got to my level um, yeah. which was the, the highest in, in, in Ireland but um, I don't think it was ever good enough to step on to, to, to the English stage well, uh, and, and recruitment can very much be learned I think we both we both agree on that as long as you you put the work in where I suppose football you either have it or you don't was that fair yeah. okay, to me? That's it. Yeah. And, and and then like 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 we've seen with with footballers, many talented footballers don't feel or they do feel because they haven't got the sacrifice, the dedication, the discipline, they do it and, and recruitment's the same. So on, on, so your life changed. You were both uh, based in Derry in Northern Ireland for, for 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 your whole life. And then all of a sudden you're in Perth with your uh, your now wife, both working in recruitment. How did you find the lifestyle? How how did you spend how did you spend your weeks? And um, was it the, the sunshine dream that uh, that you were promised? Yeah, so I, I um, went with football. I there, there's like a four month break um, at Christmas time in Ireland. So I did a bit of traveling through Australia, Asia, New Zealand, and I fell in love with Perth when I was there. Um, and it wasn't just the the weather. Obviously, the weather's nice. Um, but it was the the people, the kind of it wasn't that big, bustly London, Paris, even Sydney to a certain extent. I just fell in love with the expat community. Everybody was there for one reason: enjoy themselves, make some money, have some fun. Um, it was a good time in my life. Um, I had no real responsibilities, no children at the time. Um, it was a perfect fit for for maybe the the five year plan that we that we had. Um, that we had planned to stay there. Um, obviously, the football as well. It was only Hyundai was only starting to put money into grassroots football at, um, in Australia, so the football was kind of pretty new as well out there. It was the third or fourth sport, um, so that that gave me a good a good chance to play part time, enjoy myself a little bit more, and then and then work full time. Um, but again, Australia at that stage was was had maybe nine ten. 12 years e economic growth so it was uh it was pretty it was pretty good times and and during that period we had the iron ore collapse and everything changed and it it, it all of a sudden became a more difficult place to be a recruiter and um, specifically you were on a startup day. sorry about that gareth we had a little technical difficulty no problem <laughs> so i was just saying so you you, you were finished up with your uh, your career as a footballer you'd started your new career as a recruiter you're in a wonderful place you're enjoying it everything's great um and the iron ore price crashes and for anybody that doesn't understand western australia is very reliant on the iron ore price could you elaborate into how that affected your career uh, your your career starting a new desk as a recruiter yeah, well, um, I think we were. I was about seven or eight months in whenever it really um, started to deteriorate. But I was lucky enough at Robert Walters in Perth. Uh, the 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 director there, Ryan, had built up about fifty five consultants, and I was in a good. I was in a good place to learn from. There was real. There was real talent in that in that particular office. Um, we obviously got to know was to. We got to know the rest of the, the companies and the consultants with Hayes and S3 and Progressive. But I have to say, Robert Walters, I was in a good place to learn 
from from the people when it was going well, obviously for the first seven months, but also how they adapted more so than how I adapted. So I kind of was a little bit of a sponge learning how they adapted to um, a really, really good desk and how they would they would make money in, in, a, in a not so good economy, which which happened in there and or and everything kind of, um, as you say, it affects everything, account of finance, legal, sales and market and construction, IT, uh, everyone was affected. But there were certain recruiters and, and consultants in that office that adapt, adapted better than others. And I kind of aligned myself and kept myself as close as possible to, to those guys. Brilliant. And so you enjoyed, so you, in total, how long were you in Perth for? So it was just over two years. Um, we left in uh, two thousand and uh, early two thousand fourteen. And you were on a four five seven sponsorship visa, is that right? That's right. Yeah. Okay. Great. And was there any temptation to get a permanent residency back then and and make a make a real life at it, or did did you have other plans? Um, no, to be honest, even with the the kind of downturn with uh, iron ore, I still really liked the, the the whole package that that Australia had. I was enjoying my football. The lifestyle was incredible. We had built up a good good expat community, um, a lot of good friends. Um, I could see that. It was a little bit of a downturn, but Australia still had enough money, and, and Perth in particular, there was still enough mo- money circulating to maybe move into the. And I think I did slightly move away from mining into commercial constructions and got in, involved in the the federal projects and infrastructure to try and uh, to try and make some money there and make some fees. Mm. So I could see Australia not not going. Let's let's put it this way: not going the same way as Ireland went, where yeah. the. the the arts completely fell out of it. Um, it still had enough to, to keep it going. and But it was just, it ended up that my wife's brother um, took ill um, and we made the decision to move closer to home. We weren't ready to move home, uh, but we, we wanted to be closer to home. Um, and Australia was just too far away. So that brings us on to the, the, next, uh, the next part of, uh, of your journey. Um, New York, tell us about that. How how did you how did you get a visa? How did you get a job? Um, and uh, yeah, walk us through some of that. So um, I obviously dragged my girlfriend at the time to Perth. So I kind of gave her the option of making the the next call. Uh, and her company at the time, Progressive, which was part of the S three brand, gave her the options of Dublin, London, and New York. Um, and like any. 26 27 year old woman they just want to they just want to be in new york walking up fifth <laughs> avenue so uh that was an easy decision but on her part um, and i just i went with it so we she got transferred internally um i went and spoke with robert walters um did all the interviews went and met them in new york um they wanted to place me in the legal team within new york um i decided that this wasn't this wasn't something i'd be caught co- well I honestly didn't know what I was getting into, and that was one of the reasons that I that I didn't go with the sure. the desk. Um, so I, I went then, and, and like any recruiter, put a few irons in the fire, interviewed with several companies in New York, um, and decided Hayes would be the company for me. Um, and I was an account manager with Hayes on their IT desk. And that is uh, that's is that three years ago now or two years? That would be three and a half years, so early two thousand and fourteen. Yeah, for four, nearly four years now. Yeah, and I think I think it's important for anybody listening. Back then, there was only a finite number of recruitment companies that could sponsor in New York, so your your choice wouldn't be what it is today. And you must have seen that uh, a, a massive growth in UK recruiters in your time in New York. It was incredible. Um, when I first arrived, so that was early 2014, there were uh, probably seven or eight consultants in the in, in the office. And within a year and a half, there was maybe 20. And the majority of those were people that had come from New Zealand, Australia, parts of Asia, and a lot from the UK. Um, again, all on sponsorships. They were all on E2 visas, um, which... It was pretty difficult to get uh, and a pretty long process. I think mines in total took around four months. Um, but yes, the, the, it, 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 
they're still doing it, but it's it's definitely more difficult to get now. And how did how did the markets compare? How how did that experience go? Because Perth, I I would think is is just a big country town, and well, you'll be better able to explain New York, but it, it just seems it seems incredibly large and and diverse. Yeah, I um again haven't just kind of got comfortable with Paris after um maybe just over a year and, and everyone knows when you go into a new desk it can take it up to a year to to become comfortable and and, and really start to make make it some good cash. Um so I just got comfortable, got a good desk room in Paris. Um I found Paris now that I can kind of compare the two of Perth easier because it was more relationship driven. You could meet people, you could get people on the phone easier. Um, New York was completely different. It was more transactional, um, more difficult to get into to clients, so more difficult to break break doors down. Um, that IT desk that I stepped on, I stepped into in New York with Hayes, was very very much a startup as well. Um, mm. You were competing against real established brands. Um, the, and it became it. It was it was a difficult six or seven months, um, and especially picking up IT as well. Um, it was it was. I mean, I did a degree in IT. Yeah, so I uh, I had a I finished a, I had a degree in IT um, back in two thousand six, but I hadn't been in the IT industry or working with an IT in about twelve years. So. Getting up to speed with how IT works in New York took a little bit of time, but also the desk for Hayes in New York, the IT desk, was was basically a startup as well. So I went from one startup desk to the next startup <laughs> desk. <laughs> Very good. And all the time that you're doing this and going through the pressures of moving countries and setting up new desks, um, you're dragging your old aching body through semi-professional football. How, how was that experience in New York? Um, New York was it was good. Um, I joined a, a local Irish team, Lansdowne Boys. Um, I really enjoyed the football in Perth uh, because of the weather and because of the heat. Mm. It was slightly slower than Europe or or even North America. Um, so it was a little bit more enjoyable. Um, the heat helped, obviously. Um, New York then. You're you're dealing with the seasons and dealing with harsh seasons at that. Um, so don't get me wrong, the summer is absolutely beautiful. The the autumn's nice, but the winter is really harsh. It can get I think the the lowest that it got when we were there was minus sixteen. Wow. So uh, again, you're playing in plastic pitches, not good for a guy my age. At that stage it was maybe thirty-two, thirty-three. Um so it was tough playing a match on a Sunday and then coming into work on a Monday. Um, it wasn't easy. And maybe having a couple of beers as well. There was always beers involved. Uh, <laughs> and so just on that, uh, lifestyle in New York, I, I've taken it, you, you, you ate out a lot and, uh, and, and enjoyed the good life there. Yeah, I mean, like you can imagine New York, um, just the, the variety, the options, the different cultures, the different restaurants. It was it was a real eye opener. Um, Perth definitely didn't, wasn't as cosmopolitan, wasn't as diverse. Um, New York was incredible for that. Um, really, really nice food, really, really different food. Um, a lot of bars, nice bars. They love their sport, sports bars. Um, really good lifestyle that way, but really busy and really difficult to get involved um, with uh, communities. So mm. really difficult to, to find find groups of friends to to, to, to hang on to. It took us a little bit longer in New York. Um, a lot of people are running around really busy, have no time for anyone. Yeah. Uh, to build up that that network that we had in, in, in Perth, um, it took us a lot longer. Really, really, really difficult. Yeah. And with living in Perth, you obviously took advantage of uh, the close proximity to Bali and places like that for, for traveling. In America, did you, did you manage to, to get to see any other locations? Yeah, so we were uh, we were in LA, we were in Vegas, uh, we were in we went to Aruba for a honeymoon. Uh, we were in Boston, uh, we went to New Jersey quite a lot. Um, yeah, there was I mean you're especially with New York being a, a, a an airport hub, you're you're not far from anywhere, and you can you can make a a good flight. 
um, not that long, and, and it's pretty reasonable as well. So it's um, that that was that was enjoyable, and it's something that two two and a half years there, I did take advantage of, but I probably should have done a little bit more. Doesn't sound like you should have done more from that. <laughs> you could always do more. <laughs> yeah, brilliant. And uh, just uh, just on uh, a last question that we have: if uh, if you could do it, uh, if you could do it all over again, what uh, what advice would you give yourself? So probably for for the the the. For your, for obviously, people listening will be recruiters, maybe thinking about moving. Um, I would definitely look into um, or do a little bit more research into the starting. Basically, the, the, the issue I maybe had, and maybe it's why I, I didn't make as much money as I should. I went from one startup desk to another startup desk. Mm. Now, it was a good brand. Um, Robert Walters and Hayes are fantastic. The training I got at Robert Walters was un- incredible. It really was. And it probably stood me instead to be able to try and tackle the US. Um, but I would definitely make sure that I'm going into a warmer market. Um, it's definitely a warmer market now. I felt with a startup um, IT desk under Hayes, all we were doing was was building a database for people in, in four or five years to make a lot of money. Yeah. I would imagine that the people in that, in my desk now are making plenty of money. Um, I had a kind of pivot. Um, they, they are. We try and headhunt them quite a bit. <laughs> um, I had a kind of pivot and specialised myself to try and make some money. Um, I ended up getting on Verizon, the 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 big largest Hayes account in the US, and I made some money in contract recruitment there. But I would definitely going back to your question. I would definitely do more research um, and again using someone like yourself to be able to kind of consult and, and give me advice on that it's, it's, Bla- it's blatant plug there that's great we love that <laughs> um, and so just that, that kind of leads me on to there's, there's three major brands that, that influenced you uh, S3 with, uh, with your wife Kira, who was a top performer there um, Robert Walters as you mentioned and, uh, and Hayes as well um, you, you've now gone back to set up uh, your own company and grow your family as well. You went back and played a little bit of football. You did all of this at the same time. Um, can, can you walk us through that process and, 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 and what, you're, what you're trying to achieve right now? So, um, yeah, exactly. Stressful, stressful times. Um, <laughs> Uh, so yeah, I did, I came back and played a little bit of football before actually jumping into the, the start of the business. Did a bit of feasibility studying and what I was going to do. Uh, so I kind of took what I learned in all three um, with my wife, with S three, uh, with Hayes, with Robert Walters. I kind of took the best of it all, but more so than that, I probably took the best of the consultants that I worked with. Um, I probably probably learned more from them. Than I did the, the brands, you know. There was mm. there was guys that just 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 got it. Yeah, so as I mentioned, Delta, um, when you say what did I take from Hayes, Robert Walters, S three, um, I really did. I learned a lot from them, and my wife was able to advise me on S three. Just simple things like incentives, branding, initiatives, work life balance, culture, but the most things. The big thing that I took was the guys within these offices that were far superior to everyone else. Um, these guys just got it. They just understood how recruitment worked. They got it early. They made a lot of money early, and they stick to their processes. Um, as I said, I wasn't the sharpest tool in the box. I never, never got it when I first started, but I, I, I stuck close to the guys that did, and I took the best parts from what they did, and I'm trying now to bring it all together with my company now, Niche Specialist Staffing Partners. Um, and your wife, your wife got it from day one, is that correct? Yeah, I would say she got it much better than than, than I did, but I wouldn't tell her that. <laughs> yeah, you just have. Uh, <laughs> and is there anything you could identify that would uh, that, that kind of sets apart the top performers than, than the, for a better word, the also rounds? Um, so I think I think the desk that she went on and the mentor or manager that she had helped a lot. 
but she definitely picked it up quicker. Um, she, her background was a marketing degree from University of Ulster. Um, so she definitely had a little bit more of a, a, a no fear at the time. I was a little bit, she was a little bit younger than me. I was a little bit apprehensive. I didn't really listen as much as she would have. Um, so she was definitely easy, easily trained, if you want to say that. But she definitely had the, the outgoing personality um, and the attitude to, to, to listen. And, 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 away, and away from uh, yourself and, and Kira, was there, was there any other traits that, that you recognized from, from, from recruiters that, that you look for now when you, when you try and expand your own team? Um, yeah, so you, you mentioned it before, I think, with the whole football thing, you're, you're trainable in, in, uh, in recruitment. So I would definitely w look for the, the softer skills rather than the technical stuff. Um, as you say, everything can be trained, but see someone that is punctual, they're dedicated, they, 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 they understand that they need to sacrifice something to achieve something. That's something that, that, that doesn't come with everyone, and especially the, the next generation. Um, we just made our first hire two months ago, um, and this lady, this lady is, is she, she's good. She just understands that, and she's proven throughout her career, she's made sacrifices, whether it be personal, whether it be career sacrifices, and, and she's, she, she's reaped the rewards, you know. Um, Brilliant. It's, it's very difficult to, to, to teach that. Yeah, and and just to finish up, um, tell us a little bit about your business and and what your plans are for scaling it, and and maybe any openings that uh, that that you have right now in uh, in Northern Ireland. Good, yeah. So we are three people at the moment: myself, my wife, and Tricia Bracken, uh, and we recruit construction estimators, or as the Europeans would know them, quantity surveyors for the east coast of America. Now, it's, um, I say the East Coast, we've predominantly identified North Carolina, South Carolina and Atlanta as the main areas of focus at the moment. Um, so we're going well. We're about 16 months in. Um, we're going to hire our second employee. We're doing a, a second round of interviews next week. So we should be four strong and we plan to hire two people every year until we're in probably around 26 states in the US only yeah. doing only doing quantity surveyors or estimators within the construction market. Fantastic. Okay, great stuff. And, uh, and if anybody, anybody wants to reach out from, uh, from the northwest of Ireland, uh, where can they find you? Yeah, always looking for people. So we're, we're on, uh, we're on the, the, our website, Niche SSP, but LinkedIn generally is the, the best place to find me. Um, Gareth McGlynn or Kira McGlynn. Um, I lo always looking for junior recruiters or even people without experience we can train them up um, and also admins okay great stuff well thanks very much gareth um i've really enjoyed this and uh and we hope to ho hope and wish you every bit of success in the future thank you Dalton. we'll catch up again soon appreciate it Bye. cheers A massive thank you to Gareth McGlynn for taking part in the first ever episode of Recruiter Abroad. We had some technical issues and the sound quality was a bit patchy in places, so I must apologise for that. Luckily, we just cut next week's episode and there was no such problems. I'll be speaking to Dara Everard, who's the country manager for Walker Anderson in Ireland. His journey began leaving Ireland during the recession and moving to Australia, where he lived for over five years. He recently moved back to launch the Anderson Partnership in Dublin. And his story is a great example of how you can accelerate your career by moving abroad. If you're interested in coming on the show and discussing your own recruitment journey, we'd love to hear from you. Also, if you'd like to reach out to us and find out what opportunities we have at the moment, please do not hesitate. You can find me by WhatsApp, email, or just on LinkedIn. All my details will be included in the show notes. See you next week, and thank you so much for listening. The podcast you just heard was recorded with Anchor. If you want to make your own, download the Android or iOS app completely free from anchor.fm slash podcast. That's anchor.fm slash podcast.